A lot of the 20th century research and into the 21st century has been in trying to find out how children learn to get themselves into the world, how they learn how things operate in the world, how they learn to put things together. There's an awful lot to think about. Uh, how you get dressed to go to school, why you wear different clothes at different times, how you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whether you have sweet stuff before uh, sour stuff, uh, how you sing, how you act towards people you know versus people you don't know. If you actually think about what you do, you'll realize that you have hundreds of different routines in your mind about how to act. Now most of the research that started was on simple association, hit, ball, dog, bark, etc. Uh, and while it's important at really the age of two to be able to do things like that, it doesn't really tell you about how to operate in the world, how to get on the bus to go to school, how to read a book, when to talk, when you're free to scream and run around, when you're free not to, how to deal with unexpected challenges, how to deal with your family as opposed to other people. So something more complicated has to be very important in how we deal with things. And many scientists, psychologists, child development scientists, psychiatrists have begun to feel that the way in which people learn is in stories. Uh, they may be simple stories like how to go to the drugstore and buy something. They may be complicated stories, like what do I have to do in order to get married? Or what do I have to do if I want to be a fireman? But they're still stories. They are things that link events together in a meaningful way. They're not very simple. Of course, it's very important to know how to read. Uh, it's very important to know how to use language. But it's also very important to know how all these words, how all these concepts come together uh, in order to make something that's really meaningful for ourselves. The best way to think about this is stories. That we have stories about ourselves, we have stories about other people, we have stories about our life, we have stories about our country's life, we have our stories about political life, uh, etc. And that we key them up, we tell each other them, etc. So it's no accident that stories have been found to be very important in cognitive development. Certain stories, though, are a little different than just the put your clothes on before you go to school type stories. Uh, they've reoccurred uh, and reoccurred throughout the world. Uh, they've been shown, for instance, by the author Idris Shah to occur in culture after culture with pretty much the same structure. So for instance, there's a Cinderella that was invented and told by the Algonquin Indians. Um, there are stories that are pretty universal throughout all cultures, and they've been collected, uh, especially by Idris Shah, uh, for, the current, um, for current learning and teaching. Now, why is it important that there are these universal stories. It's because these stories contain important elements of learning uh, for children and for adults, elements that are not really replaceable in any other way. Their very universality shows that they're very important to the basic process of becoming human. This special kind of story is a form of literature that's not very known in the West, but it's been common in the Middle East and Central Asia, especially in countries like Afghanistan, Iran, other Central Asian countries. Um, it helps develop thinking skills and perceptions because it introduces kids and adults to events in unusual combinations. The psychological significance of these stories has only recently, really only in about the last 30 years, been rediscovered in the West. And they're called teaching stories as opposed to the normal kind of stories which kids uh, read 
some of them, some of the more normal kind of stories may be stories with morals, how to act, how to behave, how to be a proper person. Teaching stories tell you a little more about yourself, how to look at yourself in unfamiliar situations, and they prepare you for the unfamiliar events that may happen later in life, and they develop the mind in unexpected ways. These teaching stories can often appear to be little more than fairy tales or folk tales. In fact, fairy tales and folk tales have at their origin many teaching stories, and this is the way they've been able to seep into the culture. Uh, but they're designed to embody in their characters, in their plots, and in their imagery patterns and relationships that nurture a part of the mind that can't be reached any other way. Um, they increase our understanding and our breadth of vision. These are stories, just like the one you've just heard, that have unusual occurrences in them, unusual things that go on, different ways of dealing with a situation. For instance, you might consider how Neem confronts the dragon in this story. He doesn't confront him in the normal way, and we can, uh, we can talk about that later. Most of our daily life is pretty predictable. Um, we have pretty ordinary routines. We get up, kids go to school, they learn at school, they come home, they have their games, they have their life events. These stories are designed to introduce into people, uh, adults and children, unusual events occurrences that normally don't happen, uh, even in the safe and comforting harbor of a uh, storytelling situation. When they do that, they prepare the mind to develop more flexibility and to understand the complexities of the world a little better. Now, most children won't have encountered so many unusual situations, obviously, but these stories especially get them prepared to look at the world in a more complex um, and a more complex way and a way in which um, they can develop more context. Now we'll hear the second story in this series. It's called The Clever Boy and the Terrible Dangerous Animal. The Clever Boy and the Terrible, Dangerous Animal by Idris Shaw Illustrated by Rosemary Santiago Once upon a time, there was a very clever boy who lived in a village. Nearby was another village that he had never visited. When he was old enough to be allowed to go about on his own, he thought he would like to see the other village. So one day, he asked his mother if he could go, and she said, Yes, as long as you look both ways before you cross the road. You must be very careful. The boy agreed and set off at once. When he got to the side of the road, he looked both ways. And because there was nothing coming, he knew he could cross safely. And that's just what he did. Then he skipped down the road towards the other village. Just outside that village, he came upon a crowd of people who were standing in a field. And he went up to them to see what they were doing. As he drew near, he heard them saying, Ooh, and ah, oh, and oh and he saw that they looked quite frightened. He went up to one of the men and said, Why are you saying ooh and ah and oh? And why are you all so frightened? Oh dear me, said the man. There is a terrible, dangerous animal in this field, and we are all very frightened, because it might attack us. Where is the terrible, dangerous animal? asked 
asked the boy, looking around. Oh, be careful, be careful, cried the people. But the clever boy asked again, Where is the terrible, dangerous animal? And so the people pointed to the middle of the field. And when the boy looked where they pointed, he saw a very large watermelon. That's not a terrible, dangerous animal, laughed the boy. Yes, it is, it is, cried the people. Keep away, it might bite you. Now the boy saw that these people were very silly indeed. So he said to them, I'll go and kill this dangerous animal for you. No, no, cried the people. It's too terrible, it's too dangerous. It might bite you. Ooh, ah, uh, oh. But the boy went right up to the watermelon, took a knife out of his pocket, and cut a large slice out of it. The people were astonished. What a brave boy, they said. He's killed the terrible, dangerous animal. As they spoke, the boy took a bite out of the large slice of watermelon. It tasted delicious. Look, cried the people. Now he's eating the terrible, dangerous animal. He must be a terrible, dangerous boy. As the boy walked away from the middle of the field, waving his knife and eating the watermelon, the people ran away, saying, Don't attack us, you terrible, dangerous boy! Keep away! At this, the boy laughed again. He laughed and laughed and laughed. And then the people wondered why he was laughing. So they crept back. What are you laughing at? They asked timidly. You're such a silly lot of people, said the boy. You don't know that what you call a dangerous animal is just a watermelon. Watermelons are very nice to eat. We've got lots of them in our village, and everyone eats them. Then the people became interested, and someone said, Well, how do we get watermelons? You take the seeds out of a watermelon, and you plant them like this, he said putting a few of the seeds in the ground. Then you give them water and look after them. And after a while, lots and lots of watermelons will grow from the seeds. So the people did what the boy showed them. And now, in all the fields of that village, they have lots and lots and lots of watermelons. They sell some, and they eat some, and they give some away. And that's why their village is called Watermelon Village. And just think, it all happened because a clever boy was not afraid when a lot of silly people thought something was dangerous just because they had never seen it before. Now I've said these stories are very different from ordinary reading and writing. And in order to see how, that, how different they were, I set up 
a series of studies to see what happens inside.